The deep okay. problems are now of public health. All right, so we chafe with the solitude. We try to overcome it with technology. A in we text. A, uh, Zoom, kind of fringe into of the um, we are all immunologists now. burlap skirt while listening to the New, York, New Yorker radio well hour now. But then okay. something happens. Joy comes at seven, or is it sheer catharsis? At seven o'clock in neighborhoods across the city, cheering breaks out as though the Yankees had clinched the World Series. It spills from the stoops and the sidewalks, from apartment windows and rooftops. We take our smartphones and start recording the roar, laughing, the wooing, the tambourines and the wind chimes. The guy across the street is a master of the cowbell, and we don't mind. Before it all dies down, we've sent the recording to a loved one who works in an ER. And we send it to others who are in bed or out of range of our dense and Canyon City, the city described on the news as the epicenter. The cheering is for all the nurses, orderlies, doctors, EMTs. It's for the courage of professionals who may work without the protective gear that they need. Some of them have seen their salaries cut, some have fallen ill, and others soon will. We're applauding Anthony Fauci, who must spend nearly as much mental energy trying to finesse the ignorance and ego of his commander-in-chief as he does in assessing the course of the virus. We're cheering researchers and labs all over the world who are at work on treatments or vaccines. We're cheering people who make the city work at their peril. Grocery clerks and ambulance drivers, sanitation workers, pharmacists and mail carriers, truckers, cops, firemen, the delivery man who shrugs off the straps of his knapsack and jabs at the intercom buzzer with a gloved finger. We cheer those who provide straight information and look out for the most vulnerable among us, the poor, the aged, the incarcerated. And we cheer the artists who have lost their gigs but are posting paintings on Instagram, FaceTiming their soliloquies, singing into iPhones. We know the limits of this release, this cheering. There's a feeling of helplessness. Hi, Lucasia. But it's what we have. Hi. Glad to president see we're both moving along here. Reality, that as many as one or two hundred thousand okay. could die in this pandemic. These coming weeks are and will be demanding in ways that few of us could have anticipated. It's the wrap skirt. If New Yorkers are in hiding. The virus has shown a knack for seeing. But with time, time and discipline, life will return to the city. Our city and your city. The doors will open hmm. and we'll leave our homes. We'll greet our friends face to face at long delayed Easter services and Passover seders. Children will go to class with their teachers. Okay. So now Five we're gonna sew. <laughs> And fill. One day, remnants of the crisis will be tucked away, out of sight and out of mind. A box of gloves, a bag of makeshift masks, containers of drying Clorox wipes. We'll forget a lot about our city's suspended life, but we'll remember who we lost. We will remember the terrible cost of time squandered, and we'll remember the sound. At seven o'clock. I'm listening to this great piece on the New Yorker radio hour while putting on the final fringe for Burlap wrap skirt. This is the New Yorker Radio Hour. 
and David Redman. On first glance, public entertainment seems to be indifferent to who we are. Princes and prime ministers, musicians and Hollywood A-listers, NBA players, all sorts of prominent people have made headlines for contracting the virus. But when we look at the numbers of illnesses and fatalities, we see, emerge. we see the inequality that's part of the American healthcare system. We find the kinds of disparities that cause worse outcomes in many different ways for people who are disadvantaged. Kianga Yamada Taylor has written for many publications, including the New Yorker, about racial inequality. She's an assistant professor of African American studies at Princeton and the author of Race for Profit. I reached her last week. Now, Professor Taylor, there are some really alarming numbers coming out of all over the country that show that minorities, particularly African Americans, are succumbing to COVID-19 at absolutely staggering rates. In Louisiana, African Americans are 33% of the population, but account for 70% of the deaths from the coronavirus. And this is all of us, Chicago, and Mississippi, and in New York, what factor or combination of factors contributes to this shocking disparity? So I think that there are a few things. The first thing is that it is almost too easy to point to the kind of underlying conditions that African Americans are particularly vulnerable to, whether that is hypertension, whether it's obesity, asthma, really all of the long-term diseases of disinvestment, underemployment, and in some cases poverty, um, pre-existing uh, conditions don't necessarily make people more vulnerable to the virus, but it means that if you get the virus, um, that it can have deadly effects. And then we can talk about the inability to affect it for distancing. I think as a prerequisite for effective social distancing, you need to have a safe, sound, and comfortable housing. You need access to uh, uh, You need access to And so I think because of the ways that black people are overrepresented in professions that only allow for working at home, only make two percent of black people have the ability to work at home because of the types of jobs that they are uh, employed in. Uh, jobs that are typically low-waged and uh, degraded, which now, ironically, are seen as a future. Um, Work like magic to pull people away from the safety uh, of social distancing. And so African Americans in New York City are still not put on the front line to get to work. Um, and so social distancing is critical, but you have to have a certain kind of income and class position, really, to be able to fully engage that practice. How does this manifest itself in terms of our healthcare system, in, in terms of institutional racism 